thank you for joining us today uh, for this um, webinar, seminar webinar uh, for the uh, Emory Global Diabetes Research Center. I'm Mark Hutchison, the Managing Director, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lynn Abu Jawadi, yeah. uh, who is uh, a visiting fellow with us, and she is uh, from the uh, University of Lille in France, and she is a second year PhD student in management of uh, health and vulnerability at the Lumen Lab. And she has a background in both nutrition and social sciences. Her PhD research focus is on the understanding and development of a diabetes prevention program in a vulnerable population. And that is the topic of today's talk. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, having me. So um, I'm uh, uh, first thing. So uh, my name is Len, and I'm doing my PhD. I'm midway in my PhD. I'm I'll be finishing by the end of next year. Uh, so um, my PhD is on the development and management of the diabetes prevention program in vulnerable population, and I'm uh, very grateful to be here today uh, for a uh, month uh, as part of a research day. Um, so, um, so uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. So, uh, uh, yeah, my university is up here in France, uh, it's in the north uh, of France, and my lab is uh, the new university management lab, the Lumen Lab. Um, so, um, I'm uh, at the management lab as well as um, at Presidia, which is the National Center for Precision Medicine on Diabetes, which is a research center focused on the prevention of uh, on the prevention and the treatment of diabetes. So, um, uh, Presidia uh, is the uh, is um. Center uh, that is funding the project, the Prevent Lab project that uh, my uh, PhD and, uh, and uh, the Pasteur Institute of Lille is the promoter of the project. Uh, the Pasteur Institute of Lille is an international, uh, an international research foundation that aims to contribute to the application of health prevention for public policy. Uh, so these are uh, your So today I'll be presenting uh, the context of uh, my project, uh, a little review, the program, uh, the programmatization process, uh, the methodology, uh, a sample description. Uh, I will focus a bit on the qualitative of uh, my PhD pro uh, project. And then I will present uh, preliminary, preliminary results and discussion. So for the context, um, so the idea of the project uh, is the prevent that project is that um, in the north of France, so here, Lille is here, um, the region where uh, we have the department of the north, and uh, so the and this region is of uh, the highest in France. So we have mainly the highest rates are uh, in the north and in the south. And at the same time, we can see that um, the diabetes prevalence is also of the north. And so, um, so that's the idea of the project uh, to um, be able to prevent diabetes and our region. Uh, for the literature review, at uh, first I uh, tried to conceptualize the concept of uh, vulnerability because literature, the concept of vulnerability uh, is not, um, we don't see all of literature uh, defining these terms uh, at the same um, at the same perspective. So, um, and I wanted uh, to talk about vulnerability, exclusion, uh, disaffiliation, rather than poverty and economic poverty, because I feel that 
the social aspect is uh, very important. So um, my um, my concept uh, my conceptualization of uh, these terms is um, is based on uh, uh, the process uh, of uh, Robert Castle, who is a French sociologist, and he defines uh, uh, by starting with two axes. So we have the social axis uh, that goes from exclusion to inclusion, so social exclusion and inclusion. And then we have the uh, vertical axis uh, it goes from precariousness and lack of employment to employment stability. So at the heart of this, of uh, this axis, we have vulnerability. And vulnerability is uh, defined by uncertainty, risk, ability, the ability to cope with the risk, decreased standard of living and well-being. And uh, it's very important uh, to note that it's a dynamic process and not just uh, a fixed state because uh, the, uh, because vulnerability can come in, at any phase of life and it can really change. So um, based on that, uh, based on that, um, Robert Castle defines uh, the word disaffiliation as uh, the great marginality, and it, it comes after vulnerability and really the lack of employment and relational isolation. So it's particularly interesting uh, to look at the health disaffiliation and how, uh, and I will uh, talk more about this later, but like how to reconnect people who are uh, disaffiliated from health. And uh, I also uh, put the assistance and uh, the graph because uh, in the French, uh, in the French, um, literature and French uh, setting, it's very, very important to note that there's a lot of assistance, either social assistance or uh, health assistance. Uh, for example, uh, social security covers from 70 to 100% of uh, healthcare. So uh, the, health, the assistance is a very important, uh, is a very important of uh, the healthcare uh, pathway in France. So when literature, uh, when we look into health disaffiliation, the two more, uh, the two um, the two topics that are the most uh, uh, covered are health literacy and uh, the access to health system. Interesting to see. Um, yeah, it would look into the access to the healthcare system and the French setting where it is covered by social security. So. Um, uh, in my interview that I will be saying later, uh, like I try to see uh, why why uh, connected sometimes to the healthcare system, um, knowing that uh, they are assisted and, um, and encouraged uh, to uh, to be in the healthcare system. aims at preventing or decreasing deprivation of uh, illness or the possible consequences of health risks and uh, the and the risk is at the heart of the, the definition of vulnerability. So it's a particularly interesting to see uh, to to work on a vulnerable population and uh, an approach that we will be using uh, the the action research um, the action research uh, perspective approach. And it's about advancing research while benefiting the well being the well being of the population. Uh, so there will be an active participation of both researchers and the individuals in the study population. Um, so uh, the researcher will be the one involved in the coaching. So I'll be talking about this more later. And uh, the health prevention challenges that we aim uh, on studying are. Uh, at first, the consideration of the vulnerable populations that are joining this. So it's important to always remember that it's not a homogeneous population, but we, uh, but we really have a subgroups and heterogeneous subgroups. And then um, uh, a very the 
literature review, uh, uh, the challenge of the memorization and normalization of health discourses, uh, which lead to health, uh, to, uh, which leads to individual responsibility and then to uh, often to build and uh, to stigmatization and discrimination and then further exclusion. And the idea that we are really looking to integrate people. So, uh, so these are the challenges that we are uh, trying to look into. So the question that I've been asking myself are how do we characterize affiliated patients and the dynamics they go through? And how do they experience their exclusion from the health system? How to set up specific sustainable prevention tools adapted to health disaffiliated people through action research? And how to set up these prevention tools while avoiding the moralization and stigmatization of the population? And um, the, the big question is how to connect or reconnect health disaffiliated patients to the health care to prevention. So for the methodology, so at first I will present the whole project uh, methodology. So at first we have, so, um, so the prevent project is uh, divided into two phases, phase one and phase two. So uh, phase one is the actual ongoing uh, phase of the cross-sectional epidemiological study aiming at characterizing and defining our population. So uh, with parameters uh, that are also demographic, clinical, biological, and behavioral. And, behavioral. and um, so the idea is that we have people uh, coming at the uh, health examination center at the Pasteur Institute of Health. And uh, so they are, mainly they are uh, the social like an SMS, and uh, so they, with a link where they can subscribe to go do a very elaborated health examination. And uh, so when they go to their appointment, uh, I have colleagues who uh, show them a video about our study, and uh, we tell them what are the goals of the study and what they are going to uh, to do initial health exam. And if they consent to the participation, so they will, uh, during their appointment, they will stay a bit more to do uh, more exams and surveys. And so uh, they will be included in the main group. So we are, um, who are targeting uh, almost 2,000 people. And here we are almost at 900. And um, if they accept to participate, they um, could be. Uh, contacted to participate in the case control subgroup, uh, where we will have a case control uh, subgroup with 144 people. Um, so, uh, and, uh, during which I do the qualitative interview. And then, now we're still writing the protocol for phase two, and it will be the action research study. Uh, with two groups, the intervention group where they will have coaching sessions, uh, nutritional, physical activity, and uh, psychological session uh, monitoring, and the control group with only monitoring. <clears throat> so here are the parameters of uh, uh, phase one. So here in the subgroup, in the subgroup, uh, <clears throat> There's the semi-directed positive interview. For the sample descriptions, as I was saying, we have the main group, and then uh, we choose the subgroup based on uh, so the case and control groups are uh, assigned based on sex, age, and BMI. And uh, the cases are um, either pre-diabetic uh, people or uh, people with unknown and untreated diabetes. So, uh, I do my qualitative interviews with part of the subgroup, not everyone, based on how much people can say uh, for the visit. So uh, today we have like uh, and uh, uh, from these 110 people, I have 65 people who did the qualitative, uh, the qualitative interviews. So uh, here I present my um, 
I present the population that is that just had a qualitative interview. So I think that is my main focus in my PhD project. Um, so uh, we have more uh, we have more males than females because uh, uh, as we are choosing people in um, case groups, we have more people that are male uh, and who are pre-diabetic or unknown diabetes. And uh, so the average age is uh, 51. The average BMI is 29. Glycemia uh, like, you know, 1.2, A1C 5.62. And um, the score I keep, uh, the score that is used in uh, healthcare uh, examination centers in France uh, to um, to assess whether a, pay, a person is precarious or not. So um, uh, the idea that in that survey, they are asked questions about like if they have the health insurance uh, other than the normal social security, if they, uh, if they are living alone, if, uh, they got, if they got to go on vacation for uh, that. Uh, so uh, think about the daily activities and then there's a score. Uh, that um, tells us whether uh, the person is uh, in a precarious category or not. So, uh, and the idea is that um, I also try to, uh, for my interviews, I try to not really look at the results, not really be biased when I'm conducting the interview. So, professional categories, I have 32 percent of. Uh, the people uh, that I'm interviewing that are, uh, they don't have a professional activity. Uh, some of our students, but at uh, the age of uh, my group is uh, a bit high, so like very few students. The rest are people who are uh, searching for a job. We have time to employees, and I also have 24% of uh, the sample that are in an executive uh, position. Interviews. Um, in the qualitative interviews, I aim at learning about people's daily lifestyles, understanding their uh, behaviors, exploring the inclusion or ex their inclusion or exclusion from the healthcare pathway, and exploring health uh, literacy and access. So for the interview guide, as, as a semi-directive uh, interview, so I have. Uh, I have an interview guide, but I let, I also let the conversation uh, uh, lead me to uh, to more think and uh, idea that I need to uh, to ask the person. But generally, I start with general questions like uh, the personal and professional situation of the person, what they do in their daily uh, in their daily life. And um, questions about food and physical activity, so whether they do physical activity or not, even in their like uh, how um, how they um, they go to work or uh, so uh, like if they have physical activity like put in their like food. Uh, so food is like the um, the question that people are most the most comfortable talking about. So that's why I it's. Uh, one of the first questions and uh, i asked them about like uh, their groceries if they have a budget and their groceries and now as uh, as their the inflation so how does that uh, influence their their food consumption and then uh, what do they eat uh, who do they eat with uh, so questions like that and then for the magical uh, questions I asked them about their uh, their uh, how frequently they go see a health professional. Uh, why uh, why did they come do the health examination? Because like they got the SMS that they could subscribe to come do the health examination, but they could have not um, come as well. So why did they come? And why did they accept to participate in the study? And their own perception about their health, because they we have the results that they got from the health examination, but there's also a whole other perception that they have about their own health. 
And uh, for diabetes, it's more about their knowledge about diabetes. And, um, here we got many preconceived ideas about diabetes that they, if they, if they, if they don't personally have diabetes, uh, so uh, of them know someone in their close circle that has diabetes. So that's how they get their information on diabetes. And for the social questions, there are not really uh, specific questions that I ask, but it's mainly uh, in all of the uh, all of the other categories that I can really know, uh, for example, who they eat with, who they live with, uh, so their relation with the healthcare professional, uh, and um, who from their family has diabetes, um, Often they participate in the study because someone in their family has diabetes and they want to have uh, research on diabetes. Analysis uh, for the qualitative data. So I, it's a grounded theory approach where I go back and forth between literature review and the coding of, uh, of uh, the verbatim. So uh, the idea is to go back and forth, and uh, I, at some point I also added questions because I wanted to go further on a certain topic or idea. My closing process, um, I'm sorry it's in French, but it's a screenshot about my closing process. Uh, so uh, I have like big, uh, big codes. Like uh, physical activity, food, employment, uh, finances, um, the activities that they do, uh, why they participated in the study, weight. I put a, a category for a code for weight because they talk a lot about that. Um, the, the general quality of life and health. So for example, uh, if I click on uh, physical activity, I have subcategories and uh, that's how I code my uh, my uh, data. And then for health, uh, like I have a, a subcategory for diabetes, uh, perception of uh, health. And I have, um, I also have, I also do relations with a category. For example, when I ask people about their perception of their own health, sometimes they just tell me that they feel like their health could be better because they could. So here I have a relation between even like they could have better health because they could do more uh, physical activity. So here I have a relation between health and physical. Health. For uh, the preliminary results and discussion. So um, what I'm uh, trying uh, to do is focus on three um, big chapters that I want to uh, develop in my thesis. So uh, the first one is the construction of uh, health capital, how the people uh, use their cultural, social, and economic capital uh, to construct a health capital, and here I uh, look a lot on on the works of Daniel French sociologist who studied a lot about capital, and that idea that also lifelong earning, so that they can they could construct their health capital um, as a process, not really something that they stop earning, and uh, the idea that and uh, the fact that. Um, people can construct their own health capital, and the fact that you can help them do that, integrate uh, more uh, as a rational decision maker and the healthcare pathway. Because often I get participants tell me that that like uh, they don't really understand, for for example, the prescription of thing to them, and sometimes like. Uh, they don't really feel like they want to ask because they feel like they wouldn't know. So, uh, so the idea is to really empower uh, the patient. So here I put two examples of, of how people sometimes construct their health capital based on, for example, your culture. Here uh, we have uh, a woman who um, 
learned about uh, from her mother about a herb that could not only treat diabetes but uh, stomach aches. And here it's really culture and it's something that was it's an information that was passed to her from uh, generation to generation. And then uh, for the economic side, we have uh, here a person who was who felt like he needed a. Um, physical activity uh, coach, but he couldn't afford it, so he decided to uh, give up money. Another uh, chapter that I want to discuss is the tensions regarding health. And um, these tensions come from, uh, uh, for example, the memorization of health discourses. And then we have a tension um, on whether to comply or not. Uh, rather, I or uh, or the person who just uh, want to do uh, other than what the health discourses are. So um, this this tension between the compliance and non-compliance can create individual responsibility, uh, guilt, and um, and sometimes the the patient the patients feel like uh, they really don't know uh, what to do and sometimes they really decided what they want to do. So here I got uh, I got two uh, two participants who are, who are really saying like the opposite. So one um, so the first one was telling me that he only goes to the doctor if he needs to go to the doctor. He otherwise would be losing his time and and uh, like if he doesn't need to see a cardiologist, just see a cardiologist just to make him. Uh, um, and at the same time, I have another person who was telling me that it's my first visit here. I didn't know how this is to work, but it's really great that this is covered by the social security. And he was really saying that, um, so this is offered to him. So it's like his duty as a citizen uh, to go to the health examination uh, because it's like it's offered to him so he could make use of it. So here, uh, these are like functions of how, um, of how to comply or not. And then an example of, uh, of um, a person who came, um, she was uh, 69 years old, and she was telling me that uh, she regrets the fact that she didn't comply before and that now she's paying for it and that um, she, she, she feels that people will pay for it sooner or later. So uh, now she regrets not doing that uh, earlier. Uh, a third topic uh, that I want to develop is the safe therapeutic spaces. Came uh, mainly, this idea came mainly when uh, I had uh, females, the females that are like um, more than 60 years old. Um, I had a lot of, uh, uh, of these uh, women being like they lived alone. So when they came to when they came to uh, to the interview, they really felt like they were really sharing a lot of their uh, their life, and uh, so here I really felt like uh, it was a space where they could talk. So here uh, we had the idea to uh, have a prevention uh, space where people would feel like they. If they heard and they could really hear everything that was uh, being passed. So um, at first, uh, in literature, we see that uh, the initial perception on hand spaces influences a lot uh, people's uh, perception. Like people have negative perception sometimes of hand spaces because they picture hospitals and illness. So uh, uh, the fact that the idea is to really change that into a more positive space. And then um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, the relationship between the patient and the health professional 
are, um, are really something that could influence whether the person has or not. So, um, so we have the relationship between the patient and the health profession, but as well, sometimes when there's coaching sessions in groups, and so uh, there's also the impacts of the groups and communities and the health prevention profession. So it's really relational. Here, for example, I put a verbatim of a woman that um, she doesn't feel uh, comfortable talking uh, up, uh, with the doctors about her problem, her problem because she didn't feel hurt. So uh, that she didn't feel um, treatment. So she trained many doctors. And uh, so this even affected, uh, affected her view on uh, healthcare. So uh, the idea is to uh, really uh, create uh, therapeutic spaces where people would really feel comfortable to receive uh, health prevention. So uh, these are mainly the three topics that I want to develop in my work. And uh, so as I finish by the end of next year, so I will be starting to write. So uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, listening. Um, for having me at the easy Questions? Uh, there's... Ah, thank you. Ah, oops. Okay, so it was uh, the fact that when I moved further from the microphone, I, I did not... Um... <laughs> that's what like sorry I have a question Lynn um really interesting work I'm looking forward to hearing more about what you find as you continue are you doing any uh like planned comparisons in the data specifically I'm kind of wondering because you know when you showed the quotes earlier about the worker versus the executive and how they have very different opinions or if you maybe looked at um people who are born in France versus people who had moved to France and how their experiences are or are not different because that seems important for planning your intervention. So what are you kind of going to do in that space? Yeah, yeah. You may want to, if you could just, yeah. a short version. Mm -hmm. Sorry, <laughs> oh, sorry it's a long question. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, um, for the closing process, I use Zanvivo, uh, Zanvivo uh, uh, software where, uh, so I mainly use it to organize, to organize everything because uh, like you're saying, like uh, I put uh, the glycemia, uh, the, the social professional category and everything so that um, when I'm, when I check the code, I can also check the category of the characteristics of the person who are saying that to know in the same uh, in the same code and the same category of the coding process is saying what and uh, how uh, for example here and the two people that uh, were saying the thing that are opposite about the compliance and non-compliance um so they are from a different Social professional categories, so that's also uh, yeah, it was uh, something that I should have. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if I uh, answered. The... I think that helps. It sounds like you're deciding which comparison <laughs> still to make. Um, but I mean, I feel like maybe that quote just was by chance that you had two very different people. But I am wondering what you know, with especially this is a huge qualitative data set. Um, we don't normally have 65 interviews. <laughs> so I think that you have a great opportunity to really look at differences. And I know we talked about this on the phone, how in France, like looking at racial differences is very frowned upon, as opposed to here, we're very used to using that. But I, I do feel like there's probably going to be a pretty striking difference between someone who grew up in France who's reluctant health system is maybe not because they don't understand it versus somebody who moves from somewhere else and comes from a very different background, but you may not find that at all. And I'm just sort yeah. of curious. Uh, we have that in the, um, like we ask them because in France, it's not really, it's very, um, 
difficult to have studies working I was telling you the time that uh, having data about uh, ethnic uh, ethnicity and uh, uh, racial categories is not really something that is really done so because um, uh, we, there's a discrimination lag in that but we got the approval in our study to have this information so uh, uh, we do have that and here uh, in which they arrived in France. So yeah, I, I should uh, I should add that. Um, um. <laughs> yeah, place of place of birth, you, you should be able to like born in France. Yes, no, you have yeah. Yeah, I think that that. Sorry, sorry. But if you see, was like economic opportunities. Uh, yeah, actually, um, yeah, I, all of these are taken from the communities that I have. So, yeah, I could, I could trust that, but now it's a lot of uh, data as well. And, uh, uh, so, uh, I will be trying to focus on a few things, but, uh, but that yeah, really also, uh, differs from who's saying the, the verb. I, I mean, I think it, it relates to what you're saying. Uh, uh, I guess let, let me let me ask you uh, for your time here. What will your focus be? For the time that you're spending. Uh, so Can we just repeat that? The, the question was uh, for your time here. What will your focus be? <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, then we refer to one of the my. Project uh, to everyone, and um, so um, I will have your insight today. But uh, um, here, like, um, there are a lot of um, it will be uh, really great to um, the point of view of everyone. Other other research things that I could do here. So I'm I mean, first of all, we can make a great comment. Again, welcome to Henry. So the uh, question I had was uh, first about like how to define the study population. So you showed that you had defined pre-diabetes with a past measure. Mm -hmm. uh, and why do you not consider like IGT like or impaired glucose tolerance with like a definition of pre-diabetes? Because most of the population here are obese and you tend to have like or overweight, you have like an often like a not, not overlap between IFG and IGT. So how do you choose your pre-diabetes definition? And at least clinic recruitments or where did you recruit them from the community? How did you find the people? Yeah. And, the are... so, and that, so the first part was how do you do, how did you define <laughs> pre-diabetes and diabetes? And the second part was how do you recruit the patients? How do you recruit the patients? Okay, so uh, so uh, for the diabetes, so uh, uh, we mainly took that come from so uh, we all of the uh, the other parameters we already have done, so we can be the and for the recruitment, there are people as I was saying that are coming for the half examination center because there is like global half examination that people can do like every five years, so they receive an SMA and they can take an appointment. And I can do that at the Pastel Institute of Peel for the people who live in me. Um, not me, for the people who are in the north, uh, northern France, they can all come to, to the Pastel Institute of Peel to do this examination because social security, security is by, by region. And um, so when they come to this appointment, um, so we show them a video about the study. And then uh, they consent to participate 
uh, and they accept the fact that they will stay uh, a bit longer. So uh, instead of leaving at 11 that morning, they will leave at like um, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, if they accept all of the other also uh, things that, that will happen. So uh, they are eligible to participate in the for the second visit for the subgroup, so uh, in the consent, uh, there is a place where they say if they accept to be called for the second visit or not. And then for the subgroup, like from 2,000 people, we need one, like 140. So, um, like the idea is that uh, it's really randomized and we just assign people between the case and the, and the control group. Uh, by age, sex, and uh, the amount. So, using existing definition, uh, and did you, I think, uh, the team do like an uh, oral glucose tolerance test, like a two hour OCT? Did they do a two hour oral glucose tolerance test? Uh, was that done? Yeah, and the, the, um, and you're asking about how we got the number of. Uh, how we get the the Yes. Uh, so yeah, we can define that. So uh, you can have like high passing glucose, yeah. or you can have, have two or uh, post family glucose also. Yeah, the passing glucose. So then why do you use passing definition and not the other one? Or a mix of both? Uh yeah, actually here we have the passing uh, the passing glucose and the GA one C. At first we were just uh, uh, we were just looking into the the fasting glucose and then uh, able to do the HbA1c for everyone because in the health examination that that is offered by the social security uh, the HbA1c is not included so when able to, it was started really in the early years in people uh, so when so now we do they want to for everyone, and we have the two. So we have passing glucose and H one. I don't think OGTTs are as widely used in Europe. I don't. I feel like I remember that from an ADA talk, but I I wouldn't quote me on it. But I feel like this is it, it came up before. They're also expensive, but I think they're not widely used clinically, and so there's more. Actually, it's because uh, it's not the uh, basic health insurance. Yeah. It's expensive. It's also a big sample, but because I, I, and I only kind of paid attention. But you know, at ADA, there's always lots of talks on this HbA1c debate, and Europe sort of got on board with HbA1c as a as a diagnostic criteria a little bit easier and faster. Do they in Southern North? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. You would think. There's such overlap. I mean, because HbA1c is sort of a not a perfect me measure either, right? Yeah, well, and you would expect to have more IGT because of what you were talking about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so, if people are staying three extra hours, did you have some incentives to get them? And did you go with candy or something too? <laughs> and uh, the question was. Yeah. Say for three hours, did you get extra incentives? Give <laughs> uh, uh, them a reward to participate. Uh, like, uh, for the interview. For the interview. Yeah, it was a three, like 25 euros. <laughs> for the, no, for the first, uh, for the first uh, main group, they don't get anything actually, but they are. Exam, so they just stay later and um, a bit later, and we're basically don't. It's not an intervention, but it's an examination. So for the main group, uh, it's not an. Uh, it's like twenty five euros and uh, uh, transportation for it. Twenty five euros to participate for. In the main group. Super in group because like they're coming just for the uh, actually and um, friend is not really uh, uh really high unless there's really a treatment that they have to take uh, it's like just to cover the fact that they are coming uh, for two hours to do the main group uh,
it's forbidden to pay them. Yeah. Oh no, you wouldn't like if, to get people to talk to you for this long without paying them. Well, that's funny because we do it, but it's in India, but more like food and gifts. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. No. Like a bag or a binder. But we fed people all the time, and it's even here feeding people. It's a good way to. I mean, you could talk to me for five hours for like a nice <laughs> loaf of French bread and some cheese. And I'm just like, oh, no. Maybe a bottle of wine. <laughs> Uh, you considering like giving let's say some new AI driven method which you can uh, do some sentiment analysis for the pattern with like let's say topics covered in your data. Bring that up. Are you considering using AI for analysis? Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, not really. Actually, I'm doing a with uh, Anna, and uh, it's not really a plan on the AI like that. I'm really focusing on the verbatim of what people and um, uh, there are a lot of software that can code the uh, uh, qualitative data, but I'm really focusing on verbatim like. Um, uh, uh, thematic and then. But would you be open to something? Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of It's not, yeah, it's It's a total option. But if you want to do it, do it in any works. We have tons of quality data. And there is a lot of data. But let her put it, she needs to publish her grounded theory paper first again. But you would understand. So, like, could you could you guys use the same data to do some kind of AI analysis? Sure. I mean, I think it'd be. So, how data. how is the data? How easily available is the data? Well, it is in French too. So. <laughs> <It's> AI. <laughs> yeah. So, is it possible for others to use the data? Yeah, with my supervisor, I have uh, two supervisors. Uh, there's Lengo, who is my She's um, an assistant professor, she's professor in uh, management and marketing. And uh, uh, my co supervisor works uh, as a director at the Pasteur Institute of Field in the clinical research uh, department. And we're prevent out, so uh, they're not really. But I also have to ask them because the data are the property of Prevenza. So, uh, but. Uh, <laughs>